Don't you hate it when Agent Smith is right? Here's a dead hard drive. I get phone calls from people saying to me, uh, can you repair my hard drive and then give it back to me so I can continue my work in forensics or anything else? And I tell them that there's a myth. Dead hard drives are not repaired. Dead hard drives are brought to an operational state and then the data is recovered from them and the hard drive is thrown away. If your hard drive ever has any problem, uh, you want to get your data off of it and then throw it away. So, <laughs> and in fact, this uh, is even stronger, you can say it even stronger, is that once you get your recovery going, you don't even turn that drive off until you're done. The operational state I'm talking about uh, can be very transitory. In fact, I've actually uh, called this the prime directive of data recovery. Once you get that drive working, talking about dead drive, you get it working, you get that data off. You don't shut it down and get something to eat. You don't change your mind and go for some other folder of files. You stick with it until you got it all off because it's a transitory state. Okay, who am I to uh, shatter these, these uh, preconceptions? I am likely, and I am likely to be doing this for you. I am one of the teachers here at Edmonds. I teach data recovery. I've got some expertise in uh, forensics. I know a thing or two about databases. Up in the corner there, that's me with a big smile on my face. I'm standing in New Jersey. I'm standing in West Orange, New Jersey. Where am I standing? I'm standing in Thomas Edison's library. I'm only maybe four feet from his desk. He died 84 years ago. He's the man that we think of when we think about inventor. That was a, good, a big moment for me. Point that way. Okay, best time to ask questions at the end or during lab. How do you know if your hard drive needs data recovery? Well, there are two prerequisites. One is that your data is not backed up or there aren't any other copies of it available. The second one is that your data has some value to you. You don't recover a drive if you've got it backed up. You don't recover a drive if there's nothing of value on there. Here's a hard drive that needs data recovery. This hard drive is full of water. Uh, it's a common myth that hard drives are airtight. Uh, they're not airtight, they're not watertight. There are 10 screws that go through, that go through this drive, six into the case and four through the lid. It's sealed pretty tightly. There's even a gasket you can see up there. Uh, but it is not airtight. Air has to get into the drive. It gets in through, point that way. It gets in through that hole called the breather hole, and there's a small filter up above that to keep out dust. The reason the drive is sealed is not to keep out air, but to keep out dust. Dust is the enemy of your hard drive. It's actually one of several enemies. I use the expression dust quenching because there's a thing inside there called the pillow, which will collect dust that happens to be inside the drive. I happen to have a pillow lapel pin. The pillow is actually a very important piece of equipment. You can buy these on my Etsy site. <laughs> that was a joke. People were laughing. This is why dust is a problem. Dust is big. It may seem small to you, but to your hard drive, which has a small uh, read and write head flying above the surface very rapidly, even small things like dust uh, will cause a major collision. That's not good. There's also a hole or two or three, and they're called inspection holes. These are covered with sticky aluminum foil. You can pull those back and look inside your drive. 
if you do that, you'll void your warranty. But presumably, your drive's already um, out of warranty. And besides that, you know, if your drive is in warranty, you can send it back, and they'll send you a replacement. They won't have your data on it, you know, the one they send you. They'll just be a refurbished hard drive. Students at this school saw drives like this during the Oso mudslide recovery effort. I don't think anybody's here from that. Here's a hard drive. I opened it up. There's the pillow. Why is that pillow so dark? That pillow is dark because it has dust on it. Where did that dust come from? Well, the breather hole filter is very white. That dust did not come from outside. That dust came from inside the drive. Well, how did that happen? That is a huge scratch. You've heard of the concept of data at rest and data in motion? That data moved from the platter into the pillow, from whence we cannot retrieve it. Although there's been talk of getting some strong glue and a brush, trying to put it back on again. Here are some more physical problems that hard drives encounter. This was uh, a detective asked us about this. A suspect in a child pornography case heard the sirens and decided to destroy his drive. He took a screwdriver. All the damage you see here, uh, prying up the lid, damaging the PCB, that's not so bad. But the worst thing he did was stick that screwdriver into that inspection hole through the foil and gouge the platter. It's very difficult deal with uh, scratched platters. Not only is the data gone, but the scratch itself throws off your equipment quite a bit. Difficult to recover. Here's another one. Actually, that's called a spoliation of evidence. Uh, a suspect took a torch to this one. Here's one that I got from a home uh, user. Uh, power surge caused a blowout on one of the chips on the PCB. This is repaired by, by finding a new PCB on eBay, for example. But here is the worst disaster that can befall you if your hard drive has trouble. You ask your buddies from IT to recover your data because you think that all IT guys are alike. Don't do this. Unless, of course, your data has no value to you. Then you can do whatever you want. OK, my talk has several parts. Each one gets a little bit deeper. I try to go through symptoms and explain what's causing them, some diagnostics, go back down to the drive level, see what's going on there, and some solutions. I will intersperse my talk with some comments about uh, what Edmunds CC has to offer. I keep feeling if I stand here, I'm blocking your view, but I guess I'm not. It's this feel funny feeling. My objectives are to educate you, to wow you, and to entice you. So here's a, a message that you might get on your computer. It's sent out by your BIOS. It's called a smart warning. And it's, uh, it says, uh, primary master hard drive, smart, status bad, backup and replace. And here's the part I like. Or press F1 and continue. Is it serious or not? Here's another one. This one's mediated through Windows. Immediate steps. Your drive's in danger of failing. Back up your stuff immediately. Or ask me again later. How are you supposed to react to that? I'll tell you. You, what you want to do is manually back up your files. Don't use backup. Your drive may fail while you know, that's going on. You want to manually go to your most important file, maybe the one you just got through working on, and copy that off onto another drive or a USB. 
thumb drive, immediately start with your highest priority stuff and work your way down. When you've got everything that you, you can think of that you really want, then you might run a backup on it, try to get the rest. Do not click on that, ask me again later. I, I know you're trying to get your homework done and get everything done, but believe me, when you get a smart warning, you don't want to ignore it. And I'll tell you some more about that later. Smart, uh, anything that you name with an acronym that sounds like SMART, immediately you get criticized and you get called stupid, right? That's what happened to SMART. People say SMART is stupid. And they're right because SMART doesn't usually give you a warning. And when it does, it's like almost too late. So it's turned out to be not a very useful system to warn you about drive failure. That all being said, if you do get a warning, take it seriously. To talk about SMART, we have to talk about sectors and attributes. Because what SMART does is it keeps track of a variety of attributes, like you're seeing on the page there. There are many attributes. This is just a sample. Uh, manufacturers have different sets of attributes that they keep track of. They overlap, but they're not identical. Let's talk about the sector first. In the IT world, we have complex systems. And complex systems are always handled by breaking them up into chunks. This idea of chunking is fundamental to, uh, to computer systems. So your data um, is chunked into a 512-byte sector. Each byte you can think of as basically representing one character, like on the alphabet. So your data is stored in these sectors of 512 bytes each. Now, a sector is actually bigger than 512 bytes because there's room there for other things that the drive needs to control itself, to know where things are. Uh, Steve Haley calls them GPS marks sometimes. It's, this drive needs ways to find out where your data is that makes the sector bigger than 512, but your data is 512. Point that way. So a bunch of sectors make up a track. Track is laid out on the drive. The right head writes these tracks out. If you have, you might have three platters in your drive. That's um, six sides. I've, I've drawn, the, the tracks are shown there as they're those circumferential lines. You actually can't see those because they're magnetic. But if you want to imagine them, there are basically uh, concentric rings going around. Let's talk about attributes. If you go into the firmware of the drive, and this is actually a screenshot that I made, uh, you can look at these smart attributes, but this is not very convenient. You, Lewis talked about a user interface. This is not a very convenient user interface. It's basically a hex dump. It's an hexadecimal, which you can translate easily into, into English letters and numbers. It's also in a little Indian format. If you have a strong inner geek and you're in the crowd today, if I see a little Indian, you know that I mean it's written backwards. So you can work with this if you translate it to ASCII and then reverse the order. But it's much easier to use a, a, a program that does this for you. Now, it's, I've blocked off a lot of attributes to focus on two, the current pending sector count and the offline uncorrectable. So sectors that are given the attribute pending it means they're on probation. The smart scanning system tried to read them or write to them, and something was a little bit funny. It took a little bit too long. It puts it on the pending list to look, look at that again later. But the other one there, 198, offline uncorrectable, that means it could not be read. It's a bad sector. Why do we care about that? Well, this paper came out in 2007 with three authors from Google, and they analyzed thousands of hard drives from the Google server farms, and they said, yeah, smart, you know, all these attributes, we, we really can't make a good model to predict failure with that stuff. No one's ever been able to do it. But they did find out some interesting stuff. Look at the bottom one there. 
They said, if you get even one probational sector count, odds of your dry failing within 60 days is 16 times higher than it would be if it had none of them. So that's actually pretty interesting. Once you get one pending sector, you've crossed the threshold. The other one is about allocations. So we saw that one drive had 528. It has passed the threshold of one pending sector account, right? Reallocated means that you, the sector has been lost to you. You can no longer get to it. The sad truth is that uh, SMART will never give you a warning if you get one pending sector account. It usually takes a lot of them. And in fact, you may never get a warning. You may get hundreds of them and not get a warning. You may get hundreds of reallocations and not get a warning. And then sad truth number three is once SMART starts finding these things and starts counting them up, um, it's going to find more and more and more. And that's why the odds of your dry feeling within 60 days is pretty high. Let's look at some SMART data. You can get this from a free program. So there's a SMART alert here. Do you see the red X? What's the first question I would ask you is, why is there an alert when the value, 104, is below the threshold? Huh? Well, the reason is that the value is not a raw count. That value is a normalized number. It's the result of a calculation. The other answer to that is it has to fall below the threshold trigger a smart warning. So the people that, made, that do this um, smart stuff, Western Digital, Seagate, they did not make it easy uh, for users to understand smart. They don't really want you to do this kind of a thing because they don't want you going in there and counting up your pending sectors and your Western Digital and then noticing that your Seagate doesn't have any and concluding that Seagate must be better. They don't want you doing that kind of thing. And and there's, there's some sense in that because, uh, because smart data is actually uh, not easy to understand. There, um, I, guess, I guess the slide comes up next. Let's go on to the next one here. For example, here's some smart data. The raw value is zero. So you can actually get the raw value with some programs, the actual count, not the normalized number, but the actual count. Here's one where the raw value is zero. Well, that's nice. And the normalized value is 200. OK. And it's set right at the threshold. Well, that's kind of perplexing. Wouldn't it, shouldn't it be above the threshold, you know? Because it seems like if it's already at the threshold, first one you get might bring you below it. So this might not be turned on. Sometimes the smart is not turned on. Here's one that's definitely not turned on. How do you know? The raw value, 528. The normalized value. 75, what's the threshold? Zero. When does a positive number ever get below zero? The answer is never. So this smart is not activated. This will never give you a warning. It's been turned off. Now, I'm not telling you this to send you out and look, to look at smart data. Well, you might do that for fun. There's an attribute called the seek error rate. And this actually shows why manufacturers don't like to talk about smart. If you go on the internet and look this up, don't do it now. You'll find a lot of people talking about this number. And then most of them have it all wrong. You'll see, you'll, they'll look at this number, it's really high, and they'll think, what's happening to my drive? It turns out, if you understand it correctly, it's not telling you anything uh, dangerous at all. So these numbers are very often uh, misinterpreted. So we started out by looking at a slide like this. Agent Smith is right. Just about. When you get this warning, your drive is uh, uh, on its way to being dead. If you watch the movie, the policemen aren't quite dead yet when he says this. But he was right. Better to copy your data off first manually before doing a backup. All right, let's review. Here's some smart data. Reallocated means it's lost to the user. Anything that shows up. Uh, for an allocation, even a number of one is bad because now it means you, you're on that slippery slope now to failure. The value is normalized. The alert comes out when the value falls below the threshold. 
Now here's a question for you, if you've been paying attention. If you get a smart warning, should you go out to the internet and find some free software that will show you information like this and load it up on your drive and go look at your smart? Yes. <gasps> <laughs> the answer to that question is, is no. You want to get your data off that drive. Go look at it later. Suppress your inner geek. Get your data off. You can look at the drive later with the smart, if it still runs. Now, to run those smart programs, the drive has to be running well enough to run them, right? Remember, your data is under threat. It's valuable to you, isn't it? So listen to Agent Smith. Don't ignore smart warnings. Copy your data off. Do it before backing up the drive. Any kind of data recovery or diagnostics or even giving your drive to your high-tech buddies, it's up to you to start getting that data off right now. Start with your highest priority stuff. Now here's something I didn't mention, but you'll see it again. Kind of makes sense, right? If your drive is wonky, maybe failing, you don't want to copy it back. There are a lot of free software programs out there that do beta recovery. They copy it back to the drive that they're trying to recover it from. Think about that. Yeah. Is that what you really want to do? <laughs> that drive is failing. You buy a six terabyte drive, put a lot of stuff on there, you don't want to lose it. So let's, now we're going to go into part two. What kind of problem is smart detecting? This takes us a little bit deeper now into hard drive operations and data recovery. It appears to be uh, monitoring your data sectors and telling you about problems that are happening to your data sectors. Stay on the carpet. So what do we see? We're seeing smart counting data sectors that are slow to read, hard to read or impossible to read. It's telling them up. Here's a question for you. Why would a few dozen, maybe one, a dozen, hundred, thousand, why would encountering a few hard to read, slow to read, possible to read sectors, why would that cause a drive to fail? The drive's got millions and millions of sectors on it. These aren't special sectors in any way. Why is that the prelude uh, to disaster? Sounds like a drop in the bucket, right? The answer is, point that way, we're asking the wrong question. This brings us up to the fundamental question, fundamental problem of data recovery. Now, a hard, there's two systems going on here. There's a system that's the platter that holds your data, the sectors, magnetic fields. Then there's a system that has to read that data. There are two systems. Which one is broken? That is the fundamental problem. How can we tell which one is broken? It makes a difference. You need both of them for the drive to work. Well, happens to be reading in my curriculum on this very topic. My curriculum has many, many, many uh, papers that I wrote on topics like this. Here's some more, comparing uh, forensics with data recovery. Here are some more, the prime directive different kinds of hard drive failure, logical, firmware. There is no repair. Remember that kid with the spoon in the matrix? There is no spoon. There is no repair. More articles from the curriculum. We've got a lot of stuff in this curriculum, taking up our hard drives, relocation, clean room, how to use the clean rooms, rebuilding a RAID 5. If you enter my class, this is what you get. My class meets on Saturdays, six hours, five times. You want to bring your lunch. My curriculum covers various topics like this. I won't read them off to you. You can gl glance over them very quickly. If you're a, a forensic examiner, the ones that I've just put the bar around, stand on the carpet, uh, is one you might care about. I keep feeling like I'm blocking people by standing here. I'm not blocking anybody. 
Are you blocking you? You're looking up, right? So, oh, so where does this fit into the curriculum, to the whole ecosystem of Edmonds? Well, CIS 294, it's the last class in the forensic sequence. Somebody always asks me about NAND. They want to know about mobile devices, electronic storage. So let's get this out of the way right now. Uh, talking about NAND uh, storage devices, they're found on, on uh, smartphones and tablets. Some laptops have them. This kind of storage is the kind that uses electronics to store data. These things on the right, solid state drives, little cards, things like that, thumb drives. That's, those are all examples of NAND storage. Currently, the curriculum that I teach only covers magnetic hard drive storage. But if you're patient, this is coming maybe a year, maybe a bit longer. We'll have this as well. Let's move on. Here's where we were, the fundamental problem of data recovery. Talking about those smart warnings. The answer to our question is, it's not the sectors, it's the system. It's the system that's trying to read the sectors. That's, that's the source of this problem. We're not seeing sectors going bad. We're seeing a read head starting to go bad. The read head is starting to degrade. What I mean by that is the read head is not as sensitive as it used to be to those magnetic fields that needs to sense to get your data. That's what, that's what I mean by degradation. I will elaborate. Okay. So, supposed to be a curtain there. My transitions are, are missing from the slide. You pull back the curtain, sometimes you see things you don't want to see. We were in the wrong furrow, furrow, uh, furrow magnetic domain there. Here's where we want to be, is right here. Each of those little rectangles is a, a bit, a magnetic field that we call a bit. They have a magnetic uh, polarity, either north or south, which you can think of as zero or one if you want to. They're like little bar magnets. That is how your data looks on your drive, on your platter. Now, if you were to look a little more deeply with a, a magnetic force microscope, you would see that it consists of smaller uh, domains that have a north or south orientation. That gray piece of, of, of alloy there is actually not magnetized. Uh, ferromagnetic magnetic alloys have a natural tendency to have polarized domains in them. It's, and when they're like this, it's demagnetized because they're going in opposite directions. It's not especially nulling out. There's no net north or south field here because they're altering directions. But if you send a, a, a right head over it to magnetize it, it aligns them all in the same direction. And now you've made a little magnet. A little magnet is your data. A little magnet has a very high uh, remanence. It actually holds its, holds its field very well for a very long time. Let's look at it from the point of view of intensities. This graph here is meant to show that the intensities vary a lot from bit to bit. It's not just one level of intensity. Now, if you were to measure all those magnetic intensities over the entire drive, and make a plot of them, you might get a plot like this. Most of them are probably have some average intensity, perhaps a bell-shaped curve like this, something close. If you measure millions and millions of things, right, you often get a bell curve out of that. So we, you think something like this would probably occur. Most of them have some average intensity. There are some weaker ones. There are some stronger ones, sort of like this. This uh, is important for my explanation. Point that way. The top left corner, this is the most difficult slide you're going to see today. The top left corner is a view from the deep spar uh, disk imager. Those green rectangles are data sectors that have been read, they've been recovered. When they go yellow, when they, if they're yellow instead of green, that means that that data was not read, it could not be recovered at that moment. DSPAR allows you to fuss around with controls and stuff and get hard to read sectors read. Now let's imagine that we've got, 
Now, if you've got one of those, uh, let's back up a little bit. Now, if you've got one of those uh, smart errors has occurred, so now we're here. And so we've got some smart errors, and, and we've got some sectors that are hard to read. The, the head has gotten a little bit weaker. And then some more time goes on, 20 days, a month, who knows. The clock is ticking, right? The drive's head degrades some more. Some additional sectors are no longer readable. The, the drive's head is able to read all the sectors to the right of that vertical line. I'm trying to show that as time passes on, there are many sectors showing up to the left of that that it can't read. The sector hasn't changed. It's always been a weak sector, but now the head has gotten weaker and it can no longer sense them. That's the argument I'm trying to make here. As time goes on, it gets worse. Point that way. More and more of these uh, uh, sectors become unreadable because they're a bit on the weak side. Just because the head, the read head, is having trouble reading them, it's lost its sensitivity. This is how I explain what's going on with the smart warnings. Unfortunately, smart doesn't know that this is what's causing the problem. And so it just goes merrily along, counting up your bad sectors, reallocating them. Uh, reallocation actually means, you know, that's taking the address from your sector and giving it to a new sector and a spare sector. If it takes your address away from your sector, that sector is no longer available to you. I can get to it with a, my equipment, but the Windows doesn't know about it anymore. It's basically lost to you. It's lost its address. Well, this goes on until there are no spare sectors left. And then the drive is no longer able to work. It shuts off. Kind of a fail-safe mode it goes into. Plenty of sectors left. Let's apply this now to data recovery. So we've diagnosed this drive as having a degraded head. We'd like to know, well, just how bad it is, because uh, this determines how we're going to be uh, treating this drive. It's important to know just how badly degraded the head is. So we have this workflow. Our first path is to find out if we can get the deep spar, I use the word coax, because we can control aspects of um, sector reading with the deep spar. If we can coax the deep spar to read those sectors to overcome its degraded head, that's really good. So we're going to keep doing that. In my class, you'll spend a lot of time learning how to tweak that device to get more and more of these sectors. That's, that's kind of the happy scenario. But if that fails, then we come to path two. And what we can do is turn off that read head. The deep spar allows you to turn off a read head. Now, this is a very interesting thing. This is the final part of my talk. That's what you, if you come into my lab in the afternoon, this is what you'll do. You'll turn off a read head. Now, obviously, the drive has to have more than one head for this to be of any use to us. So you're wondering, I can see you're sitting there rubbing your chin. How the heck can you recover any data if you turn off the head that's supposed to be reading it? But to be an expert to answer that question, I'll answer it for you. Oh, well, if you come to my class, I happen to have a document on this in a lab, a full-blown lab on doing this. Here's a, a lab that we, here's our lab right there. There's an expert in the lab there. Got some hard drives. Got some clean rooms behind them. Students come here to practice. We have lots of open lab time. Don't try this at home. Will you get a white lab coat? No, you won't. Bring your own white lab coat if you want one. Here's the deep spar. We have two different versions there, the V3 and the V4. They are installed into a, into a regular PC. It basically takes over the PC. 